uh, with the presentation of, of um, Magister Daniela Franke and her project, uh, which uh, Nicoletta already mentioned before. Um, Daniela is curator at the Theater Museum in Vienna, and the Theater Museum, as well as the Museum of Carriages, uh, makes part of the Kunsthistorisches Museum uh, uh, Verband, Association of the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Um, Daniela is um, head of the department for theatographic posters and playbills uh, since December 2009. She studied theater, film, and uh, television studies at in first in at the University in Erlangen, Nuremberg, and then at the University of Cologne, where she was also lecturer. And from 2003 to 2009, she worked as a researcher at the theater collection of the University of, of Cologne before she came to Vienna. In <coughs> at the theater muse museum, she has uh, she curated already several exhibitions. Um, the first one in 2013 on Japanese on stage, then another one um, a traveling exhibition, History of Europe Told by Theaters which was an international exhibition project funded by the European Union and directed by the management of the Association of Historical Theatres in Europe. Then in 2016, um, uh, she curated an um, exhibition on Baroque theatre and festivals with the title Spettacolo Barocco Theatre's Triumph together with Rudi Risati and myself. That was when we, we met first. And um, the last exhibition project was on an artist of the 20th century, Kolomon Mosa, and his relationship uh, to the stage. And this exhibition finished was finished last week in Munich. First it was in the theater museum in Vienna, and then it passed to Munich. The title of her conference is Il Pomodoro, Animated Retelling of a Baroque Festival Opera. And I don't know whether it already works or not. <laughs> now you can hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, hello, good um, afternoon. Um, the animation I'm going to present to you today, um, and which is also integrated in the preview of the website, uh, was originally created in 2016 for an exhibition at the Theater Museum in Vienna. Um, the exhibition was uh, curated by Andrea Somamatis, Rudi Risati and me, and we focused mainly on the events of the Imperial Court in Vienna um, from the um, end of the 17th century to the beginning of the 18th century due to the material we found in the collections of the Theatre Museum and uh, at other Viennese collections such as the Kunsthistorische Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts, and the Austrian National Library. The title of our exhibition, Spectacolo Barocco, Theater's Triumph, alluded to the fact that festivities and theater performances during the Baroque um, time were not only celebrating an event, but they had a special additional purpose. They were political propaganda demonstrating the self-image and the claim to power of the particular ruler. And after the performance, the events were therefore often documented by printed descriptions and illustrated librettos. These were spread widely to other European courts, especially to those members who could not have or would not have attended the event. Many of these documents were preserved and that's why we could present in our exhibition these documents together with various other materials, paintings and costumes, musical instruments and reconstructed masks, decoration sets and stage machineries. But a really, really important part of the exhibition had been the two films we presented together with the original documents of the events. Rudi Risatti has created a film on the horse ballet La Contesa dell'Aria e dell'Acqua, the contest between air and water, which he presented on the last conference in September 
2018. And I had worked on a film on the Baroque opera Il Pomodoro, The Golden Apple. Unfortunately, I was ill during the last conference and I'm very glad that Carmen, Rudy and Andrea invited me this time to, to Malaga to present my work on this film. Il Pomodoro is still one of the most famous operas of the Baroque era. The beginning of the film I will show you now informs about the why and the when and the people involved in this opera performance. While the introduction is spoken, the film presents the interior of the new court theater in Vienna, which was opened with this performance. Il Pomodoro, or in English, the golden apple, was, and most likely to this day, still is the longest, most splendid, and most expensive opera that Vienna has ever seen. It was created in 1666 as part of the celebrations for the wedding of Emperor Leopold I with the Spanish Infanta Margarita Teresa. It was first unveiled, however, a year and a half later in 1668 after the completion of the grand new court theater, now intended to celebrate the birthday of the young empress. The text originated from Francesco Spara, the music was composed by Antonio Cesti, and the design of sets and costumes was realized by Ludovico Ottavio Bornaccini. The libretto is based on the well-known story of the Judgment of Paris. Which of the three goddesses, Juno, Pallas Athena, or Venus, deserves the golden apple? Typical for the Baroque era, the opera expands upon the original story and includes additional embellishments to honor the dedicatees Leopold and Margarita Teresa and to highlight the political meaning and importance of their union. This hugely ambitious ceremonial opera is comprised of a prologue and five acts, each with up to 15 scenes. Additionally, each act ends with an interlude of elaborate choreography or staged fights, which was integrated into the plot. The entire performance took two days, with each day lasting between four and five hours. In total, 23 different stage designs were displayed, all of which will be presented here in order to recount what was arguably the most famous Viennese opera of the Baroque period. <laughs> yeah. Originally, the film was produced in German language, but for the artist project, Alexander McCarger, an American artist and set designer who was a researcher at our uh, museum the last years, did not only the translation of the narrating text, but also the voice recording. Here you can see Alex at the Blautöne Sound Studio in Vienna, and I would like to thank him very much for the engagement in this project. But let's go back to the original German version and its making of. Il Pomodoro is documented extremely well. First, there is the libretto. It was published in Italian language in Vienna in 1667, and this is also the language in which the opera was performed. A Spanish translation was published also in Vienna just one year later, in 1668, and a German translation was published some, some years later in Nuremberg in 1672. The libretto was the starting point for my work on the film. I read it to get to know the whole plot and all the characters. Second, there is the series of copper plate engraving depicting all 23 decoration sets of Il Pomodoro. <laughs> Knowing already the plot and the characters after reading the libretto, it became clear to me that every engraving shows more than just a typical Baroque decoration set, like heaven, underworld, garden, armory, courtyard, and so on. These engravings capture also important moments of action. But still, some of them left me wondering how the depicted characters and stage elements were related. 
but I will come to this later. For the most part, the copper plate engravings are preserved in simple black and white version, for example, at the Theatre Museum. But the Austrian National Library owns a beautifully colored version. The coloration dates back to the end of the 17th century, and this series was presumably part of the private chamber library of Emperor Leopold I. A selection from this series was presented in our exhibition as originals, and certainly we decided to base the animation for the retelling of the opera on these splendid sheets. The third source for the preparation of the film was a scenario on Il Pomodoro, which was published in German language in Vienna in 1668. This 56 page booklet summarizes on the one hand the content of the opera act by act and scene by scene, and on the other hand, it gives detailed information about the sequence of the decoration sets and about the stage effects in every scene. Together with this um, libretto, this scenario was extremely helpful to work on the text for the retelling of the opera. Regarding the engravings now again, various elements became more clear to me. The position of the main characters, the um, formation of groups, the entrance of carriages or machines, the appearances in the sky and other special effects simulating, for example, the elements like fire, water and wind. A very good example to explain the composition of a Baroque theatre scenery is this engraving, presenting the courtyard at the Palace of Paris in Act One. Jupiter has decided, oh sorry, was the wrong button, let's go back to the engraving. Here, here we go. Um, I can't find the mouse to go down with the text. Rudy, could you have a look? Um, well, this engraving is a very good example to explain how this Baroque engravings depicting theatrical scenes um, are functioning. Um, you can see Paris in, in the middle of the scenery, which is based on the typical Baroque decoration set of a courtyard. He is accompanied by uh, some noblemen, and in the sky you have three appearances, um, Palace Athena on the left, in the middle Juno, and on the right side the god Momus. Uh, the decoration set consists of um, six wings and has a backdrop. Yeah, it's not working so. Um, and having in mind the libretto and the scenario, um, it became clear to me that this was never to be seen on stage like that. Never. And um, in 1955, um, there was an international theater exhibition in Vienna, and for this exhibition, a uh, reconstructing model was built. You can see on this picture. And in this model, the appearances of Momos, Juno, and Pallas Athena could be lowered individually by the handles you can see above. This is a very charming previously explanation how Baroque engravings depicting theatrical actions are to be understood. But this is the only model in our collection functioning like that, um, because it would have been too much effort to build a reconstruction model for every scene of Il Pomodoro. But um, with uh, the... Um, now the digital uh, possibilities and editing software, we have um, more possibilities to do things like that. For the animation um, I created uh, for the exhibition Spectacolo Barocco, I did not write a storyboard, 
which schedules editing instructions element by element and second by second, but I wrote a narrating text consisting of several chapters. I started with a general introduction about the event you already saw, and then for retelling the opera, I had to identify the act and the concrete scene presented in each engraving. For example, for the scene you just saw on the engraving, um, this scene refers to Act 1, scenes 11 to 14. And after that, I wrote for every engraving a text limited to about one and a half minute. Um, now I have to skip to my printout because Um, well, I wrote the chapters and, and then I tried to include in every chapter the part of the plot that is told within these sequence of scenes and the information about the decoration set and the stage effects. And while summarizing the plot, I tried to quote from the libretto and while describing the scenery, I paraphrased the instructions from the libretto and the scenario. So, the text is a mixture of modern speech and historic terms. The next step was to explain to the video designer Barbara Schwertführer-Grössing how I created the narrating text and how the relation between the plot and the images is reflected in it. Barbara started by re recording the narrating text spoken by me. And then we listened to it again and took together a close look at the images. We discussed the whole material image by image and Barbara took some notes in her copy of the text and in her copies of the engravings related to key words in the text. For the most part it was immediately clear to Barbara what to, to do visually by wide shots or close-ups, by pans, by zooms, and by cuts. In some cases, I had to identify some characters or details within the engravings for her, but in general, the narrating text was sufficient information for Barbara. Already a few days later, she was able to present to me a first version of the animation on which we worked in some more meetings on small details. And I would like to say, um, thank Barbara very much for the productive cooperation in this project. In general, we aimed not to interfere too much in the original engraving. The animation has a calm flow to give the viewers the chance to discover themselves the details mentioned in the spoken text. The final version of the animation has a length of 30 minutes. This might seem quite long, but having in mind that the original performance took two days, each with up to five hours, this is a really short retelling. But let's see now how Barbara animated the engraving with the courtyard at the Palace of Paris, according to the spoken text. Without a mouse, it's hard to start the film. Where is it? I can't see it on this monitor. It's okay. okay. Paris has returned to his palace and invokes the assistance of Jupiter. Instead, Momus comes flying down through the skies. He explains to a skeptical Paris that he is no longer one who mocks others, but a fool who does not scour away from telling the truth. Their conversation gets cut off as Juno floats down into the middle of the scene in a magnificent gallery supported by clouds. Paris and Juno share compliments. He commends the magnificence of the goddess while she applauds the fairness of the selected judge. Juno offers Paris the prospect of becoming the ruler of all Asia and Europe if he awards the golden apple to her. After the goddess disappears, Momus reminds Paris again, who is already tempted, 
but power so obtained can be deceptive. Their conversation, however, cannot be continued because the next candidate has already appeared. Pallas Athena presents herself in full armor in the middle of a triumphal arch in the sky. Paris is easily frightened by her warlike appearance, but is promised by Pallas Athena that he will always, whether on land or in the seas, be victorious should he give her the golden apple. But Paris sees no reason to achieve military victories when the kingdom of his father lives in peace and all warfare is abhorrent to him. Next comes the third goddess who holds nothing back for her attendance with Paris. On Venus's order, the scene changes. Paris and Momus find themselves in a beautiful garden which the young prince immediately recognizes as that of Venus. The goddess herself is also present, accompanied by heavenly images of the great beauties. She tries to convince Paris that only she, as the goddess of love and beauty, deserves the golden apple. A reference to her hardly less beautiful companions, among them Helen of Sparta, is intended to strengthen her argument. Paris immediately falls in love with Helen, whereupon Venus offers her to him shall he give Venus the golden apple. Venus wins Paris over. The first act ends with a ballet of beauties and gods of love. At the end of the opera, the conflict between the three goddesses, Juno, Pallas, Athena, and Venus, is settled by Jupiter. He awards the golden apple to the Empress Margarita Teresa because she unites the qualities of the three goddesses, the magnificence and power of Juno, the virtue and the intellect of Pallas Athena, and the beauty and loveliness of Venus. And because the goddesses are eager to see Margarita Teresa, Jupiter opens in the sky the secret chamber of fate, inside of which all the assembled gods can see a heavenly vision of Emperor Leopold and his wife. In order to express their approval of Jupiter's judgment, Juno commands the spirits in the air, Pallas Athena calls on the terrestrial heroes, and Venus instructs the sirens and tritons of the sea to all dance together. So ends the celebratory opera Il Pomodoro with an immensely splendid concluding ballet bringing together earth, water and air. <laughs> 